Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining uh, today in the webinar for buying a home in the Netherlands. Uh, taking out uh, some time in your day. I would say sunny day uh, as the last couple of days have been, but unfortunately, uh, the rain is pouring down. I say unfortunately, on the other hand, uh, it's also nice that it's cooling off a little bit. Um, good to know before we start, today's session will be recorded and shared. That means that not only uh, the recording of me will be uh, shared, but also the uh, PowerPoint itself. So um, if you do have to do a call or anything in between, feel free to do so because you'll be able to see everything again in the coming days. Let's get started. First of all, who am I? Uh, my name is Ludo. I'm an expert buying manager in the Amsterdam region. Um, I'm from the Netherlands. I've lived in the USA for three years um, as an expat. So I joined my parents as an expat family uh, back in the day, um, but came back to the Netherlands to um, yeah, start my career. I am a proud father, a proud father of two cats. Um, if you guys are lucky, uh, they might show up on the screen today. Um, and otherwise you might hear them snoring. Um, and I obviously live in Amsterdam as well in a new build. So I just moved a few months ago to the north of Amsterdam. I've lived in the east and in the center as well. Um, so I'm uh, well, rather familiar with the city, that's for sure. Um, well, that's me. I'm also very curious who I am talking about or talking to today. Uh, it's always nice if we can yeah, potentially um, personalize the webinar a little bit towards the people that we were talking to. So I just started a poll. Feel free to, to fill it in. Um, obviously not obligated, but it uh, can be nice to see who we are chatting with today. I'll give you guys a few uh, seconds to fill this in. <clears throat> I'm saying we because I'm obviously not by myself today. Um, uh, my um, lovely colleague Robin will be sharing some information about his team as well, but we'll keep that as a surprise. <laughs> All right, we see uh, a lot of people between the 25 and 34 year range. Great, that means that you're still able to make the uh, use of the transfer tax exemption. I'll talk about that a little bit later on as well, but that is definitely a beneficial thing a lot of couples as well and the majority is either looking to buy for the reason to settle or because the rents are too high two very good reasons i think for sure all right i'm going to end the poll thank you very much guys on to the next so as I said before, greatness is achieved in the agency of others. That means that I'm not running EHM by myself. <laughs> I am doing that with uh, my lovely colleagues, um, colleagues from all over the world. We have Katie who has joined us here today. Um, she's from Cyprus. We have Giovanna from Brazil, uh, Rafaela who is also from Brazil, Ellen who is originally from the Netherlands but um, identifies as the first digital nomad ever. Um, she used to live in Thailand for a very long time and uh, was working there remotely. And Rick who is also Dutch but um, has lived in Colombia, South Africa as well. Um, good to know guys, by the way, uh, Katie has actually joined us here in the webinar as well um, because she will be hosting the Q&A. So if you do have any questions during the webinar, feel free to pop them in the Q&A um, so that she can answer them live. And then at the end of the Q or at, at the end of the webinar, if we still have some questions left, we will be discussing them uh, live as well. Cool. Um, EHN, well, uh, we are no traditional real estate agents. The reason for that being um, is that we only help with buying properties and with renting properties. We don't sell, we don't let, uh, meaning that we are specialized in the um, finding of, of properties, buying and renting. Um, especially currently, it's, it's rather difficult to uh, compare to selling to buy a property or to rent a property. So it's nice to have a agency who is specialized in these two things. Um, we don't charge a commission, we charge a fixed fee, meaning that if you're buying for 5 million or for 50k, um, we are charging exactly the same fee. Um, as you saw on the previous slide, the majority of my colleagues are expats or, or have, like myself, experienced an expat experience. Um, so we know what it's like to sell it in a new country and to make sure that we uh, help you to prevent making the same mistakes that we did. Um, Added value of EHN, well, obviously selling agents take offers from EHN more 
seriously. Um, they know that you are being helped by a professional um, and have talked with a professional about the potential risks or consequences of making an offer. Um, it is more than ever um, possible now to book viewings when uh, consumers are not able to do so. Um, selling agents nine out of 10 times have specific days for buying agents or for clients with buying agents. Um, so that is definitely an added value. Um, what well, we obviously support by reviewing Dutch legal and property documents. Um, very important as a lot, uh, which is quite strange in my eyes, but a lot of these documents are only in Dutch, like the transfer deeds, like the mortgage deed, but also a lot of the property documents that we received before making the offer. Um, so it's important to know what you're, you're buying into. Um, this is a very important one. We'll touch base on this a little bit later on as well, but uh, we help to find the market value through market data, aka um, a price research, making sure we know what you can get from the bank and um, what a competitive offer would look like. Um, we will inform you about the rules and regulations, and then what I said before, make sure that you don't make the same mistakes as we did. Cool. All right. Robin. Yes, thanks, Leo, for, for the introduction. Um, I'm Robin, Robin Uitenhagen. I won't challenge you to uh, try to pronounce my last name. It's, uh, it's quite Dutch, uh, so I'm obviously the, the second one from the right, although I changed my cook a bit. Um, uh, and uh, I'm always joined by my, by my lovely team. And uh, from left to right, it's Cesar, Eglin, myself, obviously, and Uskan. Uh, Cesar and Uskan are my fellow financial specialists, and uh, where Uskan mainly focus focuses on the administrative um, application of mortgages and it's kind of our mortgage Google or our mortgage guru if you if you if you will uh, he knows anything and everything we do too but he knows every specification so if we need to know something about anything specific we can all reach out to him and with Cesar and myself we will actually guide you through the whole house hunting process uh, where Egle is our uh, growth marketeer uh, helps us uh, well for you to be able to find us essentially yeah, to that being said, what we do is um, essentially we take care of finances when it comes to buying a property. Uh, when you want to buy a property, it can be quite daunting. First off, you have to find a property. Well, that's where uh, the, the lovely guys from Expert Housing Network uh, come in for me. Ludo is up for me, so <laughs> I hope I find the point the right. You're right here. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's where uh, Expert Housing Network uh, comes in. And what we do um, is throughout the whole house hunting process, we guide you through uh, understanding what your financial possibilities are for each and every property. First off, we always start with financial analysis. And it's not an, uh, a basic um, uh, estimate what you get when you check a calculator online, for instance, or when you call a bank which is, to be perfectly honest, pretty much the same because they use the same online tool. Um, so that's uh, what we do is a thorough financial analysis to know specifically what you can, um, can afford. And not only what you're allowed to take out, uh, take on as a mortgage, but also what makes sense in your personal situation. We'll talk a bit about it a bit later, but we'll first off check if it actually makes sense for you to buy a property. Obviously, we're called Mr. Mortgage, that's our, uh, our firm, but it doesn't necessarily mean that once we push you in buying a house, we want to give you insight in your financial situation and to make choices that actually are sensible to your personal situation. That's what we focus on. We guide you through the house hunting process in the sense that we help you understand the finances. And obviously, when your bid got accepted, not if, but when your bid got accepted, you sometimes you have to be a bit patient and sometimes you, have, you strike lucky right away. But then we'll take care of your mortgage application. Um, we'll make sure that you get the best offer uh, from uh, the, uh, with the consideration of the interest rates, so the, best, the lowest interest rate, the conditions that makes the most sense to you. So essentially that your mortgage situation is optimized as well as your whole financial situation. Really. Now, anything what Ludo already mentioned before as well, any document for the bank will also be in Dutch. Now, we don't expect you to take a crash course in Dutch. Uh, well, by all means do, but not in mortgage lingo because it's it's just very boring. So don't, don't do that. That's where we come in. We'll supply that as well. So you know exactly what you're, what you're getting yourself into and what you're signing. So that's the main thing that we're, uh, we do. We want to make give you the option to make uh, sound decisions on the correct information. So that's basically what we do. When your mortgage starts, we'll be your contact person for your mortgage as well. So that's a bit of a nutshell what we do. The reason why we do it is just because we want to give you a soft landing in the housing market and to 
um, make it from a stress situation, exciting situation. Your blood pressure will rise undoubtedly, but let's make it a positive thing and just be excited about your new home. Um, well, the whole team has experience with uh, either being from abroad uh, and came to the Netherlands or have parents that moved to the Netherlands or was raised in um, a very international, international uh, scenario or uh, situation. So that's basically what our um, focus is in, in, in shoot in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this area. So that's basically what we do, who we are. So uh, I would say, uh, Ludo, uh, take it away. Cool. Well, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. Uh, now everyone knows who we are and why we're here. Very important. Um, obviously, today's goal is to add value to you, right? As some people or some agents, they, they feel like they need to protect these, uh, these secrets. Um, well, we feel like um, we should share all the information freely. It's not a secret. Um, and uh, these things are just good to know also for a consumer and not just for an agent themselves. Um, some good to know. So I think I'm going to pop right back to you, Robin, uh, regarding the mortgage guarantee, the national mortgage guarantee. Uh, NHG. Uh, obviously, when you see NHG, that's a weird uh, abbreviation for more national mortgage guarantee, but it's a Dutch uh, <laughs> abbreviation that means the same. Um, essentially, what it means is if you buy a house uh, for less than 355,000 euros in this year, um, then you can opt for the um, kind of an insurance arrangement called national mortgage guarantee. What this kind of uh, what this insurance um, entails or this guarantee entails is should the uh, situation occur that you buy a house for let's say three hundred thousand euros, and then five years later you want to sell it and your mortgage you have repaid a bit on it and the remaining amount is three uh, two seventy five for instance. So you have a mortgage three two seventy five plus. You have to sell the property and the market dropped down significantly and the, and the value is only 250,000 euros. That means that you have 25,000 euros left if you sell the house, repay the mortgage, then there's still an opening or uh, open 25,000 euros. This is where the National Mortgage Guarantee comes in. They will pay that amount for you. And uh, that's kind of a safety measure there. But uh, what is good to keep in mind, again, they only do that when you buy a house for less than 355,000 euros this year. Now you can see that last year in 2021, there was 325. It's based on the average selling price of properties in the Netherlands over the year before. So 355 was the average selling price approximately in the year 2021. So when we near the end of the year, um, uh, and then we get a new number that will be valid from the 1st of January. And we can see what makes sense. Now, what is good to know is if you buy a house for 356,000 euros, um, you cannot apply for this uh, national borrowing guarantee at all. Also, um, there's no other way to, uh, there's no other insurance there. Now, this insurance sounds very nice. It is very nice. But what is good to keep in mind is that you have to repay in your mortgage anyway. So the risk that you have this, that you need this, is quite slim um, because uh, you repay on the mortgage property values. Well, they might not necessarily increase in value as significantly as they did the last couple of years. Um, but uh, if they stay level, you repay on the mortgage anyway. So then the risk of you having to sell the property when there is a remaining debt on it, if you sell it, is quite slim. Now, why would you use this anyway? Because there is a one-off buy-in of 0.6% of the mortgage amount that you take out. That's a detail that we'll discuss later on uh, in, in a personal call. But why you would use it as well is because you get a lower interest rate. So that's the benefit. So you have this guarantee, this insurance, and you have a lower interest rate, which gives you lower monthly payments. Uh, but again, only to the 355 limit. Cool. Thank you very much. So one question about this, something we get asked a lot. What if the purchase price is 354, but the valuation is actually higher than 355? What um, comes the valuation or the purchase price? Uh, the purchase price then, um, uh, because that's the, the lower one. Uh, in that sense, that's the current, uh, those are the current rulings. Uh, they they uh, tend to uh, move around there a bit. So it could be that the next year that they will say yes, but now we'll use the highest amount. This is also some difference that they could make later on um, uh, just to kind of reduce the more applicants. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, good question, by the Thank way. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, all right. Transfer tax. Another thing to keep in mind. Uh, what transfer tax essentially is, it's the tax that you pay once ownership is transferred from a seller to a buyer. Um, technically speaking, there are three 
rates for transfer tax, but um, assuming that the majority of the people that are attending the webinar today are buying for own residence, let's focus on two rates. And um, yeah, we've explained it in three examples, um, but prior to going through the examples, I'll explain it a little bit how it works. Is um, Technically speaking, it's always 2% of the purchase price as a transfer tax. Um, however, there are specific exemptions uh, if you meet certain requirements. Um, three major requirements. First of all, the property needs to be 400,000 euros or less purchase price, not value and not WZ, but purchase price. Um, both of the buyers need to be 35 years or younger. And um, sorry, I'm saying 35 years or under, under 35 years old. There we go. And um, it needs to be the first time that you are using this exemption. If you meet all three of these requirements, you are actually exempt from paying transfer tax, um, turning it into 0% of the purchase price, obviously. Um, if you do not meet any or uh, one of these requirements, so you're both under 35, um, you haven't used the exemption before, but you're buying at 410, then unfortunately you are not exempt and are paying 2% of the purchase price. Well, there are a few different scenarios. So if we go from left to right, um, Kate and John are both under 35 years old. Purchase price is 400K, could be lower as well. In this case, transfer tax is 0%. Fantastic, saves you 2% of the purchase price that you need to pay out of your own pocket. Um, then if we go directly to the right, um, so not the middle one, but on the right, Kate and John are both over 35 years old. Um, purchase price is also over 400K, 500K in this example. Um, in this case, Kate and John both pay 2% over their property share. Assuming that they're both 50% um, shareholder of the property, Kate pays 2% over her 250,000 and John pays 2% over his 250,000, coming to a total of 2% of over 500K. Um, now you have also a, um, a, a funny rate of 1% actually, and that is the, the, the middle one, where Kate is over 35, she's 37 in this example, and John is under, he is 33. Uh, purchase price is 400K. This means that Kate is actually paying 2% over her 50% share, but John is paying 0% over his share. So in total, they're paying 1% over the 400K. So that is also a possibility. Now, the, the um, third rate, the rate that we don't really talk about, is the investment rate. Uh, if you're buying the property for purely investment reasons, then the transfer tax is actually 8% of the purchase price. Um, this year, it's 8%. Next year, it's going up, I think, roughly to 10%. Um, so if you are buying uh, for investment reasons, uh, yeah, try to do it this year because it's only going to become more and more expensive. Um, when we share the recording with you tomorrow, um, you will be able to press the uh, blue button that you see in the bottom, the visit the transfer tax checker. You can fill in some details about yourself, about the property that you have your eye on, and then the calculator will show you how much transfer tax you were expected to pay. All righty. Well, let's go back to the, uh, the audience in this, uh, this case. So where in the process are you? I will... And start up a, another poll um, just to see where you guys are at. Um, if you have already uh, viewed some properties, um, if you've potentially already talked with an agent or with a mortgage advisor, always nice to see. All right, so we are getting some good responses in. I think the majority is researching. Makes total sense, otherwise um, you probably wouldn't be joining this webinar. Um, we see one person who has an offer accepted. Congratulations, that is always exciting. Good that you are uh, joining the webinar as well, and it might be good to uh, even have a, have a personal chat after these, uh, this webinar to see how we can uh, quickly help you and make sure that you yeah, are following the right steps. Already, and the majority of the audience hasn't spoken to an expert yet. Makes sense. Cool. All right. Thanks very much, guys, for, for filling this in. <clears throat> and we are going to move forward. Um, renting versus buying. Maybe a weird uh, weird thing to talk about renting in a webinar that is dedicated to, <laughs> dedicated to buying. But I think it's important to know the difference between renting and buying, to see the pros and cons of both. Um, so let's see what the, the pros would be of, of renting, why you should rent, or what the reasons would be for renting. Um, 
obviously it gives you a lot of flexibility, right? And the majority of the contracts, you either have a, a one year contract and then it becomes indefinite within one month's notice period, or it's just two months or two years. And uh, during that two years, you can uh, um, yeah, cancel your rent and, and find something else. So you're a lot more flexible to move. Um, you also don't have a property that you need to sell before you want to go to another property. You just cancel the, the rent and a month later, you are free of any uh, attachments to the property. Um, the taxes and maintenance are for the homeowner, for the landlord. Um, the majority of the taxes, I have to say, especially in Amsterdam, you have your uh, garbage disposal tax. This is for this is a user tax, so this is also for the tenant. Uh, but the water tax, sewage tax, property tax, these are all for the landlord um, and can be quite a substantial amount. So it's nice that a tenant doesn't have to pay that. Plus big maintenance like the paintwork on the window frames, uh, work on the roof, foundation, uh, but also if, if there are leakages or anything like that, these are all for the landlord um, and those payments that do not need to be made by tenants. Uh, the initial payments for, for uh, moving into a rental property are substantially lower than uh, the initial payment you make when buying a property. Um, the only down payment that is required is, uh, is a deposit. Um, and if everything goes well, the assumption is that you get your deposit back. Um, so in that sense, there's no down payment really at all. There are no initial costs of uh, working with a professional or having to pay any transfer taxes, for example. Um, so it's a lot cheaper to, to start off with a rental property. Some cons from owning your home, it correlates with the things mentioned above. Uh, you're paying taxes, the maintenance costs are for you, and uh, it's obviously harder to move because you first have to sell your property. Um, sellers are very lucky in the current market that it's quite easy to sell, but uh, we've also experienced markets where it's quite difficult to sell. And then if you want to move up to a different property or um, you want to move out to a different part of the world, then you first have to sell your property. And if that is um, difficult, yeah, then the, the hurdles of moving are a lot higher. Well, we hope that you guys are still uh, interested in buying a home because there are definitely reasons why you should buy a home, <clears throat> obviously. Um, again, it correlates a little bit with what we said before, but owning a home gives you a lot more stability. So um, you are not relying on a fluctuating market. Um, you do not have to move out because the landlord uh, tells you to move out. It's your home and you can stay in it as long as you want, uh, assuming that you keep paying your more monthly uh, mortgage uh, installments, of course. Um, but then you are yeah, um, free to stay for as long as you like. Um, obviously, you're making monthly payments, but um, compared to rent, these the majority of these payments are actually going into the bricks, bricks of the home, uh, meaning that you're building up uh, equity every month. Uh, a small part is interest rate or is, is interest, um, but the majority of the payments are going right back into the bricks and therefore, at the end of the, the day, back into your pocket. Um, and currently, there is a very... Um, um, attractive mortgage interest deduction applicable, meaning that at the end of the year, you are actually being uh, or you're able to deduct um, a percentage of the interest that you've paid from your uh, income taxes. So that is a, um, another incentive to start uh, looking for a purchase property. Um, then some cons from, from renting a home, obviously the, the rents, and especially in the current market, they keep on rising. I went to a, a rental viewing a few weeks ago, the asking price for the rental property was 1700 euros and um, it went for 2000, uh, which is quite insane, but there's overbidding going on on rental prices. Um, so it's, it's, it's really, really insane. And uh, the expectancy is that that will keep, uh, keep going, especially now that it's less and less attractive for investors to enter the market. So the amount of rental properties are probably going to go down a bit as well. Um, there are no tax benefits when you're renting a property. Everything that you're paying, you're paying directly to buy off the, the, the mortgage of the landlord. It's nothing that you're getting back uh, at the end of the year. Um, and because of this, also no creation of wealth, obviously. Um, cool. Robin, when it comes to the financial part of renting versus yeah. buying, what can you tell us? Um, so uh, we made a comparison between two quite similar properties, average uh, kind of similar uh, square meters, um, same kind of uh, finish. And when you compare the two, and I think that just fell out of uh, fell off this uh, this overview. But essentially, the purchasing the property, that's the from all the Barnefeld staff, 
again, um, <laughs> a word that could be very good to, put, uh, to, to practice when you want to uh, try Dutch. Um, and the Frederik Hendrikstaat. So those are quite in the same area, approximately. So then we compare the two. When you look at the, uh, the purchase price for the Van Olde Varnefeldstaat, the top one, um, the purchase price was uh, 495,000 euros. And uh, the Frederik Hendrikstaat has a, a monthly uh, a rental price of 2,500 euros on top of that. Um, so when you compare the, the two, then you have to compare, of course, what kind of monthly payments there are. Let's focus on that first now. Um, that's one thing to compare. And of course, what Ludo already mentioned, when you buy a house, there's a certain in, uh, investment that you have to do. Indeed, where the cursor is right now with the purchase financing costs. So when you look at this, um, the monthly payments for your mortgage would be uh, at a valid interest rate of this time of approximately 4%, with a mortgage of 30 years, then your monthly payments, the gross monthly payments, so that's what will be taken off your bank account every month, will be approximately 2,363 euros. So that will be taken off your bank account. Now, this monthly payment consists of two parts, really. One part is uh, repaying your mortgage. So that's essentially saving up, because if you repay your mortgage, your mortgage will be lower. If you sell that property, then it's expected that you get that money back, of course. So you can consider that a kind of saving. But, um, so, so when you look at the debt, then you also have an interest payment, of course, in the first month, that's approximately 1,650 euros. Now, when you compare that interest payment, because interest essentially is money down the drain, you don't get anything uh, back in the sense of apart from the tax benefit, but you don't get anything back from that, then not in the way of repaying your mortgage. Same applies for the monthly um, the rental payment that you do. And that is approximately 2,500 euros. So when you compare the 2,500 euros money down the drain for renting to the 1,650 money down the drain for the interest payments, then it takes you about 22 months to earn back that uh, primary uh, the, that uh, investment that you would have to do in the first place of approximately 18,750 euros. Now, what this is based on, you can say that purchase and financing costs 18,750 is all costs involved in this whole purchase and financing of this property. So that includes 2% transfer tax. This includes uh, the costs for your uh, buyer's agent, your financial specialist, the notary, the, uh, the uh, valuator, so the appraiser that determines the actual value of the property in the end, everything combined. So in 22 months, you earn back the investment that you do when you buy a property, when you compare that to renting a property. Now, does this mean that when you live in a property for, let's say, two years, that it automatically makes sense to buy a house? No, not necessarily. When it really starts making sense financially, if you live in a property at least two years, obviously, but more uh, three, four, five years, then it really starts making actual sense because then it's expected that you make a better profit and it makes more sense to do so. Now, again, this is something that gives you the information doesn't tell you what to do, but just to show you what well, these are the options, really. So when you do this, uh, this is uh, pretty much uh, this works. And I think there's another slide. Yeah, there you go. And after five years, so when you look at it, when you buy a property versus when you uh, rent a property, um, buying and renting um, the total monthly payments over the course of the whole five years, when you buy the property, it's, it's quite daunting when you consider that you spend 141,780 uh, uh, euros. That is a lot, but that consists of repayment and interest payments. When you rent a property, it's even more. It's 180,000 euros that you spend on uh, renting a property and you don't get anything back. The equity that you build up when buying a house, so that is the repayment of the mortgage. So you have a mortgage, you repay on it, and after five years, you have repaid it to uh, 49,000 euros. So it would mean, essentially, if you sell it then, that you get 49,000 euros back. This has not been taken it did nothing uh, it has not been taken into account here that the property of uh, the value of your property might go up a bit because we don't know obviously what's going to happen there i don't necessarily expect a decrease but that's uh, that's my view on the on the situation but if the value stays the same and you just repay you build up about fifty thousand euros in five years when you rent a property obviously you don't build up anything uh, so that's the the main difference between renting versus buying and again doesn't mean that you have to do it one or the other. Be uh, advised about what your situation is and what makes the most sense. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Cool, thank you. Yeah, so indeed, if you're, you're staying for only one year or two years in the Netherlands, it doesn't make total sense to do to buy a property. Um, 
but what we see after five years, there's there's definitely um, well, reasons to do so. But again, all up to you guys yourself. Cool. So market drivers. Well, we've all seen that uh, prices have been rising, especially last year. It's been insane. And now with the mortgage, um, with the interest rates rising a bit, um, I wouldn't say prices are going down, but they are stabilizing uh, a little bit, or the increase is stabilizing at least. Um, but some things that have been um, uh, driving the prices, well, obviously uh, the fiscal benefits that we talked about before. Um, there's the transfer tax exemption, big incentive to buy a property. Uh, the interest rebate at the end of the year, being able to deduct um, a part of the interest paid from your income taxes. Um, and in the Netherlands, when you are selling your property and you have made some capital gains, you are not paying um, taxes over that. So everything that you have gained from your capital is being put in your own pocket. Um, so that is, a, that is a very attractive um, way of investing as well. Um, currently, there's also still a tax-free parent donation. It's called a parent donation, but it's actually um, a family member donation. Um, currently, that's 100,000 euros, uh, which can be donated via a property tax-free. Um, this is ending, however, next year it's around 33,000 euros and um, at the end of 2023 it is going to end completely. So if you do have some wealthy family members who are willing to uh, help you out a bit, again, we'll do that uh, as soon as possible because it is um, coming to an end. Can I ask something there? Sorry. Yes, of course you yeah. can. Um, so this tax-free uh, parent donation. Um, this applies for when your parents live in the Netherlands, when they uh, live abroad. Um, so, for instance, if your parents live in the United States or somewhere else, then usually this um, uh, taxation of any gift does not apply. So, for one, there's no cap of the 100,000 euros right now. And um, also later on, there's, uh, as the uh, rulings are right now, there's no expectation that that will be taxed. The reason why is because the tax authorities just like that there will be put in more money into the Dutch economy. So then uh, that will, uh, will not usually not be considered here. If it applies, if this is a situation again applies to you, um, just schedule a call to see if it's also can be beneficial to you. Yeah, yeah. so even nicer if your family members are, are outside of the Netherlands in that sense, for sure. Cool, well, the, the low interest rates, this is, um, discussable, but it, it uh, used to be um, around the one and a half percent, where uh, now it's at four percent, still rather on the low side, um, but uh, yeah, compared to the 1.5 percent, it's obviously a bit higher, um, but money is still on the rather cheap side, and because of this, it is um, um, yeah, attractive to, to move towards a purchase property. Um, what we mentioned before, rents are expected to keep rising, currently already quite high, um, no um, equity being built up from that situation and therefore um, people are looking more towards purchase properties and the, the more people looking the higher the prices are going to be and i think the lack of supplies is a big one as well um, currently there are definitely more people looking than the amount of properties available um, especially because the majority of the people want to live in the bigger cities and um, it is rather difficult to especially because the netherlands is quite old so uh, besides Rotterdam, I would say the, the, the other cities like The Hague, Amsterdam, Utrecht, uh, they don't have a lot of high build. So at one point, yeah, the big cities are just full. You know, they, they have to either um, demolish the buildings and build them back up again so that they can double the amount of apartments in that building. Um, but as long as that's not the case or the cities are not being expanded, there will still be a lack of supply. And as long as the demand is higher than the offer, as we know, uh, prices will uh, continue to increase. Um, all right. Well, we talked about this a little bit, or Robin touched base on this already a bit um, when we were talking about purchase and financing costs. But what would you need in savings before you start? Um, we have a nice, uh, nice list here. Uh, from top to bottom, obviously transfer tax, 2% of the purchase price. Um, note that there is an exemption in play if you are buying under 400k and both are under 35 years old and using this exemption for the first time. Um, otherwise, 2% of the purchase price. 
Then you'll need a notary inside of Amsterdam. Um, you'll need a notary for the purchase contract as well. Um, but generally speaking, you won't just need it for the mortgage deed and for the transfer deed. Um, depends a little bit on where you're buying and which notary you move forward with, but technically uh, between 600 and 1100 euros for both deeds. Um, yeah, it, it depends a little bit where you buy. Also, what we advise when it comes to a notary in Amsterdam, I would advise you to go with a good notary. Um, because it can be quite daunting with the uh, uh, ground lease, with apartment rights, and all of that. Um, outside of Amsterdam, um, the majority does all the same trick, and um, yeah, then it's just advisable to go with the cheapest one. Um, if you are uh, moving with uh, or working with a consultant, that price is uh, from a bank or a mortgage uh, perspective, it's between 1500 and 3400 euros. A typical real estate agent between one to two percent of the purchase price. Obviously, EHN charges a fixed fee, so not applicable for us. We'll talk about our fees a little bit later on. Same goes for, for Robin's fees, um, also fixed, by the way. Um, we uh, will need an appraiser to come into the property to evaluate the home if we are relying on a mortgage. This is a person that does well, pretty much the same price research as I does or I do, but he um, yeah, yeah, drafts up a beautiful report that can, is sent to the bank and the bank will use that report to actually use the value. Uh, between 550 and 600 euros. Technical inspector, not something that is obligated, but something that is advised, especially in the older parts of the Netherlands. Um, someone who comes into the property to technically inspect the property, make sure everything works like it should, um, so that there aren't any uh, yeah, defaults or surprises that pop up later on. If you do not um, master the Dutch language, you are by law obligated to have an interpreter um, uh, present when we're signing the mortgage deed and the transfer deed. Um, which is quite funny. I think it's a way to, to keep in the interpreter um, uh, business as well because the majority of the notaries speak uh, fantastic English, of course. Um, but in this case, I would always advise you to move forward with an English interpreter as well because um, funny enough, uh, languages that aren't spoken that much are actually more expensive as well so um if you you know have your mother tongue but you also master the english language then just move forward with an english uh, interpreter that's, that's a lot cheaper um if you are choosing to go with a bank guarantee instead of a deposit again we'll touch base on this a bit later um but um, if you want the bank to make the deposit on your behalf um, then the price for that is between 250 euros or 1% of the guaranteed amount. Um, obviously, the bank does nothing for free. So if you want them to you, uh, make the deposit on your behalf, they will charge that fee for you. And then, as mentioned before, if you're moving forward with a NHG mortgage, then uh, the initial payment to enter in those uh, deducted interest rates and uh, insurance, it's 0.6% of the mortgage amount. Um, then we have a third column. Uh, if it's tax deductible, the yes or the no. Uh, everything that is related to a mortgage is actually tax deductible. So we're talking mortgage deed, um, bank or mortgage broker, the appraisal, and the NHG. Now it says no here at technical inspector, but if the bank actually uh, requires you to have a technical inspection done um, for the mortgage, then the technical inspection is also tax deductible. Um, however, we don't see that a lot. Technical inspections are um, nine out of 10 times done for um, the, the buyer themselves. Good to keep in mind. Um, then some tips to win in the current uh, current market, still the overheated market. So it's, it's nice to know what you should be looking out for. Um, this is a very important one, the value, value, value. Um, what do we mean with that is um, there are three different kinds of prices in, in the current housing market, I would say. We have the, the asking price, we have the market value, and we have the purchase price. Preferably, all three of them are the same, uh, but I'm not living in a dream world, and I know that is not the case. So we need to um, know what the market value is before we can come up with a potential purchase price. Asking price is obviously known because this is shared via Funda. Well, to, to work from an um, um, uh, example point of view, here we have a property that is, um, uh, has a listing price of 395,000 euros. Um, that's what we have right here. But actually the value, the market value of the property is not 395, but it's 415,000 euros. Um, preferably we'd like to buy at 415, but as you know, with the um, um, yeah, 
lack of supply, uh, prices are rising, people need to overbid over market value. So the property eventually is purchased at 435,000 euros. Well, um, people ask me a lot, what do I need to overbid over asking price to, to um, get the property to, to find the right purchase price? Very difficult question and I'll, see you, uh, I'll show you why that's the case. If you look at the difference between asking price and purchase price, um, it's 10%. But this is actually not the, the overbidding we should be looking at because um, asking price doesn't say so much about the actual value of the property as we see here. So the overbidding over market value in this case is 4.8%. Still, it's you know almost 5%, but it is definitely not 10%. Um, this is just this um, a selling agent, but it could have been the case that the selling agent didn't list it at 395, but listed it at 375. Market value is still 415, uh, purchase price is still 435, but all of a sudden the overbidding over asking price is 16%. Uh, while in reality, the actual overbidding, the overbidding over market value is still in brackets only 4.8%. Um, this is why I, I find it a difficult question is because I, I don't know how the uh, selling agent has listed the property, right? It's If he listed it 300, then um, the overbidding over asking price was even more. So um, this is why it's very important that we do a price research. This is something that we as EHN do prior to making the offer. So we know what the market value is. And then based on the market value, we can make a competitive offer. We'll be in contact with the selling agent, see what kind of interest the, they or the potential buyers have into the property, um, see what kind of offers the selling agent has in. And then based on that, make a competitive offer. And, uh, based on the purchase price. But then we know that everything over market value needs to come out of our pocket because the bank will give you up to 100% of the market value. So that's why it's very important to know what the market value is. Um, it's important also to make a winning offer. <clears throat> well, that obviously um, sounds a little bit crazy, but um, what I mean with that is uh, submitting a good offer. And um, the, the reason for that is because a highest price is not always a good offer. If we look at the um, example that we have here, if market value is 415 and we offer 500K, that means that we need to have 85,000 euros out of our pocket to cover the difference between market value and purchase price. If we don't have that money, the purchase will be canceled, can't go through, and the sellers are unable to sell. If we have a, a financial clause of 100%, then we won't get an appraisal of 450 or 500, we'll get an appraisal of 415, and therefore we can't move forward with the purchase. So if we make an offer of 435, but have a financial clause of 415 saying, hey, we can cover the difference between 415 and 435, that would be a good offer. Um, talking about financial clause, that is the, the second bullet point, offer security to the seller. Um, in very um, you know, small detail what the financial clause is. This is saying we need to have at least a certain or an X amount of financing from a bank perspective to move forward with the purchase. This can be 100% of the purchase price. This can be um, a, a certain percentage of the purchase price, or this can be 0% as well. Um, if we say 100%, that means that we need to get 100% from the bank as a mortgage. If that is not the case, if we are mortgage get rejected or uh, anything in the middle, uh, we are not obligated to move forward with purchase and there are no consequences from a buyer's perspective. Obviously, in this case, there is more risk at the seller's side that the purchase will not go through. So if we offer a bit more security saying, okay, we make an offer of 435, um, but we are able to um, have a financial clause of 415 of the market value, that means that we can show we are not relying 100% on a mortgage because we are able to offer 20,000 euros out of own pocket. Um, depending on your financial situation, depending on the market that you're looking in, it can be beneficial to, from a uh, winning the offer point of view, to actually take out the financial clause completely, um, saying that um, even if we cannot get a full mortgage, we are still obligated to move forward with the purchase. Um, obviously, you know, if we are our offer or mortgage gets rejected, uh, sellers are not expecting you to just put down 435,000 euros out of our pocket, but then we need to um, yeah, cancel the purchase and there's a cancellation fee of 10% of the purchase price. Okay. 
Um, this is a risky thing to do. You'll take the risk away from the seller completely and therefore offer 100% security. But um, the risk needs to go somewhere and therefore lands are, are played. Um, I will never take out the financial clause before consulting with uh, Robin or with a, a colleague of Robin uh, because it is a risky situation and I'm not 100% aware of someone's financial situation. And third bullet point, offering the least amount of hassle. Uh, we were talking about technical inspection before. The more um, um, subject to that we put into the uh, offer, the more of a hassle it becomes, right? If we want to have a, a technical inspection done, a foundation check done, if we want to have an asbestos check done, if we want to have an energy label recheck, these are all things that just make a, a create a bigger hassle. Um, the more smoother the, the processor is, um, the, the easier it is for a seller to accept or offer. Something to think about. And then the last one, something that has added or been adding more value the last couple of months, I would say, is, is offering a personal touch to the offer. Um, explaining who you are, uh, why you like the house, what you will be doing with the home. Um, because a lot of people, especially who have been living in a property for 10 or more years, they don't just want to give away the property to an investor or to someone who will terrorize the neighbors or anything like that. They want to leave behind a situation that is, is favorable for everyone. So if you are, um, you know, explaining that you might start a family there or, um, uh, well, just love the property for the way that the, the sellers have uh, designed it, et cetera, et cetera, it can definitely make a difference sometimes. Um, I've had cases where we have actually sent a video explaining who we are and they loved it so much that uh, an offer of 5,000 euros more got rejected and our offer got accepted just because the sellers knew that the property was being taken good care of and handed over to um, yeah, a nice and, and friendly couple. So something to think about. Um, then the last one, due diligence. So first, I'm going to ask you a question. We uh, have been talking about technical inspector and appraiser. When do you guys think that you should book the um, uh, experts? Is it before or after your offer is accepted? I'm just going to give you guys uh, a few, let, let's say, 30 seconds for uh, to, to pop it in the chat. Do you think you need to book these guys before you make the offer, or would you book them after your offer is accepted? I'll just wait uh, wait a few seconds to see what pops up in the chat. Always curious to see uh, what you guys expect to do. <clears throat> Don't be shy. Feel free to uh, to pop it in. <laughs> and otherwise, uh, I'll uh, not keep the tension up too high and, uh, and move forward. We generally see re uh, reactions come in from, uh, from both parties, uh, either before or after. It's always a little bit in balance. I'll show you what it is. So uh, preferably right here, the sweet spot um, is after the offer is accepted. Um, the reason for that is, or the, the biggest reason for that being is that um, it costs money, right? An appraiser and a technical inspector, they will not come in for free and they will charge you every time that they need to come into the house. Um, Obviously, we would like to have you know every offer that we make accepted, but sometimes it takes three or four offers to actually get a winning bid. Um, if you have to get an appraiser and a technical inspector in three or four times, that costs you a lot of money. So um, between having the offer accepted and actually signing the purchase agreement, we have around one and a half weeks to do this due diligence, to have the appraiser come in and evaluate the home, to have the technical inspector come in and uh, inspect the property. So that around here, we actually have feedback from both parties. And if any of the feedback is not to our liking, we can still cancel the purchase as we have not signed a purchase contract yet. Here in the Netherlands, uh, when buying a home, you are only um, yeah, tied or legally binded to a purchase once you sign the purchase agreement. And actually, technically speaking, only after the three-day cooling off period has ended, because these are another three days that you legally get to change your mind. Um, but that is why we want to have the experts or the due diligence or the, the, uh, um, yeah, the people come in right after, as soon as possible, um, after the offer is accepted. To give a little more of a general timeline, what we should be looking at. Um, <clears throat> From A to Z, uh, from, from the moment that you start to the moment that you get the keys and the liability term ends. 
how it works is, and, and this is quite a small area because a lot is happening, I have to say here, but you start your search, you're on Funda every day uh, with your morning cup of coffee, you open Funda, you see what is newly listed, um, depending on, um, you know, which agent you're working with and uh, what package you're choosing from, uh, you'll either send it to me or you book the viewing yourself. Um, but obviously, you'll need to go to the viewing to make sure that the property is not just nice on the pictures, but also nice in real life. If you have a, a good connection with the home, you feel at home. Um, assuming that you do feel at home and you want to move forward, that would be a cue to your agents to start the research. Uh, two researches, obviously the price research we talked about before, but also the documents check um, to make sure that the technicalities of the property are okay and that there aren't any surprises that, uh, that might pop up. Um, and then we'll submit the offer, hopefully uh, get it approved. We'll have a few hours of sitting like this, but um, hopefully we get some good news. Um, then here we have the, the, the timeline that we saw before, the one and a half weeks of due diligence. We have the appraiser come in and the technical inspector come in. Um, we'll sign the purchase agreement. Um, and this is also immediately the time that you send all the documents to Robin. So that is the um, obviously the purchase agreement, but also the appraisal report. Robin will have already requested a, a load of other documents like your, your salary slips, annual statements, employer statements, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we'll have everything. And once we sign the purchase agreement, you can press the big green application button uh, so that everything can be uh, can be put in place. Um, like mentioned before, we still have the three days to, to you know, change, your, change our minds if we want to, but obviously the, the majority of the people don't want to. They're very happy with the house that they have. Um, then on average, it takes around four weeks to uh, get the mortgage accepted. However, my experience, especially with Mr. Mortgage and with Robin, is that uh, they can do it a lot quicker. Uh, but I do feel like now that the interest rates are rising, um, that the, the time is, is taking a little bit longer. But three to four weeks is definitely a, um, a, a doable time for sure. Um, then this is a big moment as well when we get the mortgage application approved. Um, I would say, yeah, from here on, not a lot can go wrong anymore. Everything is approved, purchase agreement is signed, mortgage is approved, um, and now it's just the, the finalization of the things. Um, around uh, one or two weeks before the transfer happens, we'll get the statement of completion. It's a fancy word for final invoice. Um, it's an invoice that states all the costs that are related to the purchase. Uh, that includes transfer tax, the notary fees, the land registry fees, um, my fees, Robin fees, um, the uh, appraisal fee is on there, any municipal taxes that still need to be paid are on there. Everything will be paid directly to the notary, and then the notary is responsible for paying out everyone. Uh, makes it a lot easier for the buyer because you're just paying one invoice. And, um, makes your life easier. Before we actually have the key handover, we'll have a final inspection. Uh, this is a final viewing really before we go to the notary to make sure that the property is still in the same state as agreed upon. All the walls are standing, the kitchen is still there, um, the floor is still there. I've had situations where uh, we bought a three bedroom apartment and uh, yeah, between signing the purchase agreement and actually signing the transfer deed, the sellers were like, yeah, I never liked that wall. A two bedroom is much nicer. Yeah, obviously that is not allowed to change anything uh, of the property during this time period. Um, so that is why we have a final viewing to make sure that we, yeah, the house is still in the same state as we uh, expect it to be. Then we'll go to the notary, we'll sign the transfer deed and the mortgage deed, and then it is a key handover time and also party time, I would say. Then it's a, the ownership is transferred to you guys and you are really the um, yeah, owner of the property. Um, then you have a, it's a little bit of a gray area, but um, generally two months of a liability term. I always say, you know, use the property within the two first weeks already extensively, because the, the um, closer we are to the transfer dates, the more leverage we have to the sellers to fix any things that um, weren't noticed and, uh, during the final inspection. But yeah, it's around two, two months. And after that, uh, the liability term ends and then um, yeah, the, the process is done. Technically, or generally, uh, this time period um, is between three to five months, depending on how active you are, um, how competitive the offers are that we do. Um, depending on how quick the sellers can transfer. There are a lot of variables that can have impact on that time period, but I think um, yeah, three to five months is, is a healthy timeline to, to, to keep in the back of your minds. Alrighty.
let's move forward with the frequently asked questions. We will also, if there are any outstanding questions, of course, answer them at the end as well. But uh, we always get a few questions that are asked very frequently. Um, so we'll, we'll move forward with them as well. First of all, um, well, yeah, I see Katie pop up. I'm not going to take your shine away, Katie. This is your moment. It's better. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thanks a lot, guys, for all the information so far. Uh, so the first question is related to the mortgage. Can I get a mortgage with a temporary contract or as a freelancer, Mr. Mortgage? Um, so a short answer, yes. Uh, there are definitely possibilities. So to kind of um, uh, zoom into this, uh, let's start with the temporary contracts. Um, yes, you can. Um, if you have a temporary contract and a history in the Netherlands of being employed here, we could look at the average of the last three years, and then we have to take 90% of that. Now, usually uh, when you have temporary contracts, you've built up to a certain income. So if we have to do that, that usually uh, allows you to get a lower mortgage. So we want to see where your range is actually. So what we can do then as well is you can check in with your employer, because in the end, if we apply for a mortgage, you need an employer statement anyway. This employer statement is a standardized form. Uh, we'll supply it to you as well, uh, where you can see exactly, well, this is my name, this is my information, this is the income and uh, uh, information employer as well. Now, one additional thing that is stated on there, uh, apart from your contract term, is also uh, an employment continuation statement. Uh, this is an object, uh, an, an optional uh, section of the, what the employer can fill out, that it can state, sure, you have a temporary contract, but we have the intention to keep you on Obviously, if our if your uh, performance stays the same at least or better, um, then we intend to keep you on and give you an indefinite contract. Now, this intention is sufficient for the bank uh, to consider your full income as it is. Um, it's not legally binding, so you cannot use this form to um, to go to court later on to uh, make the employer give you an indefinite contract. It's just an intention. It is sufficient already. So why I mentioned this is because usually employers are perfectly fine supplying this um, employment continuation uh, statement. So that could be of great use when you want to apply for a mortgage. So that is when it comes to temporary contract, definitely possibilities. And let's see how we can optimize that option. Being a freelancer or entrepreneur or an employment uh, um, uh, uh, company owner, essentially the same thing. The, um, what any bank will require is at least 12 months history in the Netherlands, being registered at the Chamber of Commerce here in the Netherlands. If you have that, then we can base mortgage on that. Um, again, the more security that the bank has, um, the more likely they are to give you a mortgage. Also, the higher the percentage of your income they will actually consider in your mortgage application. So if you have one year, sure, we can start doing the calculations. If you have two years, better. If you have three years and up, that's the best situation we can secure a mortgage on. Um, now, um, it could be that you have uh, your company uh, abroad and you move it to the Netherlands. Still, you need at least 12 months history in the Netherlands. But it, in a certain situation, we can use your history from your company abroad as well to kind of bump up your maximum mortgage capacity. Again, let's uh, see uh, what your personal situation is. Uh, so in short, yes, the possibilities and be sure to be advised. Perfect. Thank you. What happens if you want to leave the country after several years? Uh, I think, Robin, this is also for you. Yeah, so by a kind of combination there. Um, so essentially what the possibilities are, uh, thanks, uh, is keep your home, but um, have mortgage costs. That is an option. Uh, do consider that if you keep the property, um, it's a residential mortgage. So your mortgage uh, lender expects you to live in a property. So if you keep the house and you just go away and rent it out or just keep it, it that's actively against the rules of the uh, mortgage. I know a lot of people do it. It wouldn't be my advice, but check in uh, to see what the options are. Second option is to rent out your home. Uh, you need permission of the bank. That is true. You need permission from your bank to do that. They will give that um, pretty much only when your company sends you abroad for a certain period of time, no more than three years, and then confirms that you move back and you live in the property again and you continue your current role at the company. So that's the situation where the bank does allow you to rent out your property. Um, uh, otherwise, they need you to refinance, so you have to change your mortgage from a regular mortgage into an investment mortgage. Also, definitely possibilities there. Or the third option, obviously, 
is sell your home without any penalty or capital gains tax. What, is, what we mean by that is if you sell your house, automatically your mortgage will be repaid out of um, the, the, the selling price of the property. Um, you don't pay any penalty by repaying your mortgage in full when you sell the house. Anything that you have left, so that's the gain that you have, the profit that you actually made, is, that is not taxed by uh, the tax authorities. So that's a, a, a benefit there. Yeah, so those are the options really. Um, Ludo, do you have anything to add there? No, not really, actually. No, thank you very much for that. <laughs> I'd love to, but um, that would be overkill. So no, not needed. Sure. Okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Ludo, can I rent out my house or a room in my house? Well, this is a good question. A question we get, get asked a lot. Um, both, both are possible. Um, but there are some um, uh, things that you need to keep in mind when doing either of these. So let's first look at uh, renting out a room um, because that's a little bit easier if you are your home um, owner, but you have a spare room and you'd like to um, have someone help you pay off the mortgage payments, then you can rent out a room. Uh, you don't necessarily need to have permission from the bank to do so. Um, however, it is always advised to draft up a agreement with the tenant um, to yeah, just protect your own rights in that sense, because tenants in the Netherlands have uh, very, very strong rights. This is also why banks um, don't prefer to have properties or have you rent out your total home, because a property with tenants in it is just worth less than a property without tenants. So if at one point you want to sell your property and you still have a person renting a room in your home, then technically speaking, especially after a year or so, they uh, will receive tenant rights. And uh, can, if they don't want to leave, they don't have to leave. So then you have to sell your house with that tenant in your room. Um, and that, that just creates an awkward situation and also a situation where um, the, your selling price will become lower. So have a... Um, agreement with the tenant um, that clearly states that if you want to sell the property that they need to leave um, and, and some other things. Um, then renting out a house is a little bit more difficult. Um, again, not, not impossible, of course, but uh, banks don't prefer it. Um, you will need to get, first of all, permission from uh, the bank to do so. Now, bank don't, uh, banks don't uh, are not very flexible with that, don't hand them out for free. Um, you'll definitely need to change your, your mortgage type from a residential mortgage to a buy-to-let mortgage. Um, you will need to have a, um, your, the amount of mortgage um, will be lower as well. This is a little bit yeah, difficult in the sense that it might be that the market has risen and you have already paid off a certain amount of your mortgage, um, but still you are not able to have um, when, especially when you initially buy purely to um, rent out your home, you will not be able to get 100% mortgage. Um, besides this, um, you need to keep in mind that you are also paying the 8% transfer tax rate. So um, instead of paying the residential rate or the um, exemption rate, you are paying 8%. Um, so all of these things are good to keep in mind. But yeah, technically speaking, yes, you can rent out your house or part of your house. Did I miss anything, uh, Robin? No, that's pretty much it. This transfer tax only applies, by the way, when you buy a house and rent it out right away. Uh, that's the only yeah, thing. Yeah, of course. When you own a property and you convert the mortgage from residential to investment, there's no transfer of ownership, so no additional transfer tax. But uh, yeah, you covered everything uh, perfectly. Fantastic, what a power team. Um, yeah. Thank you. And then, Ludo, what is the 10% uh, percent deposit that I need to complete when buying a home? Yeah, so this is um, um, standard in every purchase agreement, in every purchase in the, uh, the Netherlands. Um, you have to yeah, transfer a 10% deposit to the notary to make sure that you will fulfill your obligations. That's pretty much what it comes down to. Um, it is uh, always something that happens one or two weeks after the mortgage um, is approved. And then you can choose to have the 10% deposit come out of own savings or um, have the bank make the deposit on your behalf. And that's the bank guarantee that we talked about before, um, which costs money, of course, obviously as well. Um, that, that is really what it comes down to. It is not, so if you look, for example, at the US, um, the USA market, where a deposit is something that you standard need to have uh, to, to uh, buy a property, because 
I think in the majority of the parts of uh, the USA, 100% mortgage is not a thing. Uh, so you need to have a down payment. And the bigger the down payment, the bigger your chances are of, of um, moving forward or winning an offer. Um, in the Netherlands, not, that's not per se the case. The deposit is always 10%. Um, but the amount of savings that you can bring to the table showing that you are not relying fully on a mortgage obviously does have an impact on the chance of getting the offer accepted. But the deposit is just there to uh, make sure that you fulfill your obligations. And also, if the purchase falls through at the end, that um, you are able to pay the 10% penalty fee to the sellers um, and yeah, to, to, to buy off the contract, pretty much. That's what it comes down to. Perfect. Thanks a lot for the answers. We have the timeline to show where the deposit is made. It would be right around here, right after the mortgage application is approved. Perfect. Thanks. So you're on mute, Katie. Oh, thanks a lot. <laughs> I was just saying thanks for answering the questions, which lead us to the next questions. What are your fees like? Yeah, that's a, it's an important one, I think, um, a good one to, to have answered. Um, I'll start. We have three packages currently, um, the smart package, complete package, and then uh, the new build package. So the difference between the, the uh, three, I'll touch base on it in, very quickly. Smart package, a little bit more for the independent buyer, someone who um, has potentially bought a home already in their, their home country, knows a little bit about the process or very much enjoys being invested into the process themselves. Um, so it's a little bit more hands-on for the buyer themselves. Within the complete package, it's someone who has maybe um, a little bit less time, someone who is very unfamiliar with the process or who just wants to have that extra support. Here we schedule the fumes for you as well. We attend the viewings, we attend the third party meetings like the inspector and the notary, and we offer some um, a transfer support there as well. Um, and then we have the new build package as well. And this is obviously a little bit different than the other two packages because we can't join you to a viewing as the property hasn't been built yet. Uh, so we'll join you to um, the meetings with the developer and with the selling agents. Uh, we'll go through all the checklists, the technical descriptions, um, the guarantees from um, the, the building corporations. Um, and we'll, we'll do a, a price benchmark and, and things like that. And obviously we'll be invested within the whole process uh, that can some, sometimes take up to two years. So it, it's um, um, yeah, nice to have support there as well. Um, how it works is uh, we work on a, uh, well, not fully a no, no cure. No, oh, no, I need to go back. There we go. Uh, we also deposit payment. For the smart, I think it's 300 euros. For the complete, it's 400 euros. And for the new build, it's also 400 euros. Um, but if we don't get you to the notary or we don't get you a purchase home, then the rest of the amount is obviously not due. So in that sense, no cure, no pay. Um, it's only the deposit to make sure that we are both invested within the process. Robin. Yes. Um, so what we do, um, we uh, start with the financial analysis, as mentioned before, we charge a small down payment for that of 299 euros to so get a clear view of your financial situation and we can guide you throughout the whole process. Um, there's no time limit on our service, uh, by the way, so if you find a property in two months, well done. Uh, if it takes you two years, I, I honestly hope it will be sooner than that and uh, undoubtedly you will, but there's no time limit there. doesn't matter how many calls we do, doesn't matter how many calculations we have to do to recalculate your situation. If your income changes, you'll find another property, and that's all, uh, all included there. Then we have different packages. Um, uh, when you want to refinance, that's when you want to, uh, when you already have a mortgage, but you want to change the interest rate, for instance, or you want to change from a re regular mortgage into an investment mortgage, we have a fixed fee of 2,499 euros. Um, all of these fees, by the way, the 299 euros is already included. So that's the down payment there. Now, when you're a first time home buyer or you buy a property to rent it out, so a buy to that or a keep to that, you already own it, but you want to, uh, well, it's a refinance, sorry. So when you buy a property, that's a fixed fee of 2,999 uh, euros. Uh, what you get for that, uh, that's again, um, uh, financial uh, analysis. We guide you through the whole house hunting process we take care of the mortgage application, so we find the best lender for you out there when your bid got accepted. We'll take care of the application, communication with the bank, 
supply with translations, set up a mortgage advisory report, financial advisory report to show you to what extent your financial situation has changed, but also what kind of financial uh, risk you might be subject to uh, when it comes to being unemployed uh, during the process of uh, having your mortgage, but also what happens if you get um, disabled so you cannot do the job to the same extent anymore and your uh, income will reduce. Or worse comes to worse, um, uh, what have, uh, happens if you or your partner comes to pass away. Let me knock on wood uh, right away to uh, not have the, all the situation happens uh, to happen. But it's always good to be well prepared in good times when something happens in uh, worse times. So that's all included there and will be your point of contact for your mortgage. Now, when we uh, secure a mortgage uh, for a property of over a million, um, then the thing is that the mortgage application gets more complicated. So the bank requires more information and it takes a bit longer to take care of everything and it's a bit more extensive. So our fee is then 3,799 uh, euros and that's uh, again all inclusive. There's one little addition, kind of depending on the situation is, but when you're an entrepreneur that also needs more work because then we have to uh, look into the, um, uh, all the figures of your company uh, and then there's an additional 500 euros. We can do that, or it can be outsourced by another company. They usually charge 500 euros or more. So then we can see what the best option for you is out there. If it's determined already by another company, then of course we won't charge that fee. Now, the, these are our fees. Uh, luckily, our fees are tax deductible. So you get it back approximately 40% the year after um, you bought the property um, when you file your tax declaration. So that's, uh, that's basically it. Perfect. Thank you. Very clear. I wish um, our uh, costs would, would become a tax deductible at one point, <laughs> but unfortunately not the case yet. Alrighty. Well, then we have our final poll, the one that is important for us. So it would be really nice if you have the time to, to fill it in, just to see uh, what your experience was. And then we'll move, uh, we'll move on to the Q&A in a bit. Take, uh, take two seconds to fill it in. All right, we are getting some nice feedback here. That is always nice. Perfect. Thank you very much, guys. Now, if there is anything that you missed, obviously feel free to book in a uh, call with us to uh, talk about your specific situation as well, um, to go a little bit more in depth so that we can um, help you on a more personal level as well. Definitely. All right, thanks very much. Let's move forward to the Q and A. There we go. Katie, you're up. <laughs> Perfect. So we had a lot of questions, so I had some time to interact with some of you. We have answered most of them, so I have only two main questions for you guys. Uh, one would be uh, from Benedict. Uh, do you work together with certain banks or do you make sure uh, or how do you make sure you get the best mortgage conditions? And this is uh, for Robin. Yes. Um, so yes, we do work together with uh, a lot of uh, a lot of different banks. Uh, we work with over thirty five banks. Um, that that's not all banks there are in in the Netherlands. There are even more. Uh, weirdly, that's uh, that's that's a lot. But we work with all the major banks for for one, and all of them have also subsidiaries or there are other uh, investors or uh, other companies that also invest in mortgages. Um, so all of these, we focus on the banks that are uh, registered at the AFM, the authorities for the financial markets, to make sure that everything is okay. Now, indeed, what we do is we have a whole list of all the lenders. We are always updated uh, on any changes of interest rates prior to the actual change of the interest rate and conditions. So we always update it on what the best option is for you out there. Not basically only what the interest rate is, also what the interest rates are, are going to be. So what we can do is we can even, when we know that the interest rates uh, will increase and your bid already got accepted, we can already lock in the interest rate to prevent you any increase. Or we can say we'll apply for the mortgage a couple of days later to make sure we get a decrease in the interest rates. Whatever works for you, best of course. So indeed, we have a range of about 35 uh, different lenders to make sure that we can get the best option for you out there. Yeah. Nice. 
Perfect. Uh, and then one last question. If I sell my current home and buy a new house, how would the mortgage rest? I currently have five years left on my fixed interest of 10 years. Can I transfer my current interest rate for the remaining five years? Uh, to a new new purchase. So what happens if uh, you already own a property? You have your fix your interest for 10 years, probably. So then uh, if you have five years remaining, that's an easy calculation that probably you bought your property five years ago. Um, so when you did, then the interest rate might have been uh, significantly lower than it is right now. Um, so to benefit from that, you can indeed, uh, depending on the lender, but usually the lenders will allow you to take, um, so your mortgage will be repaid in full, but the conditions of your mortgage, you can uh, transfer or move to new financing. That means that for the remaining five years that you have left on your contract to a lower interest rate that you can have right now, you can take that to the new financing. The only restriction there is to obviously have to stay with the same bank, um, the same uh, interest rate applies, but only for the outstanding mortgage. Anything that you borrow more than, uh, than that, that will be according to new interest rate of that, uh, of that bank. Now, so there is something to look into if it actually gives you a benefit or is there another offer from another bank that gives you even a better situation there. So that's, uh, there are definitely possibilities, but worth looking into what the best option is uh, for in that situation and then blindly uh, go with uh, what seems obvious. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. All right. I think that is it. Um, if there are any outstanding questions, feel free to book in a call with us. Um, we'd love to uh, to help you out further. I just moved to this uh, this slide as well. So the, the the blue button that you see here, that's actually a link to um, our websites to schedule in a call immediately. Um, same goes for Mr. Mortgage. Feel free to scan the Q and R, and you'll go directly to their uh, website to book in a call with them as well. I want to thank you all for your attention today and for joining and uh, taking some time out your your most likely busy days. Um, normally, I would say enjoy the weather, but uh, I would advise you to stay inside today <laughs> or take out an umbrella. Um, and then uh, wishing you a good weekend ahead as that's coming up as well. Thanks very much, Robin. Thank you, Katie, for your help. Thank you very much for your time. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Bye bye. Bye bye.